Hello everyone, this is episode 4 of my crewmate series, and in this episode we go to Duna, our first interplanetary mission of the series, although this is the first of many. At the moment I'm purchasing some new stuff with the science I got from my Mimit mission, primarily some new science gear, some better solar panels that will hopefully mean I don't run out of electricity, and some new, much bigger, more powerful rocket parts, the size 2 Rockamax engines, will also help get the larger ship into orbit. The extra solar panels should also prevent a catastrophe like what happened in the last episode from happening again. Although I recovered the... well, although the mission was ultimately a success, it wasn't perfect. Now I'm also going to check out to see if any contracts were available, and yes, I was asked to go to Duna and Ike. Originally I planned on going to just Duna, but since they are so nicely, I also thought I'd incorporate Ike into my mission plan. Just before I elaborate on that, I thought it's also slightly annoying, but I'm going to tell you about it anyway. They've also asked me to explore Minmus right after I've just been there. The same thing happened just after I've been to the moon, and well, that's a bit of a bummer. However, let's focus on building the first interplanetary rocket. I'm going to be using an asparagus staging system like I talked about in my last video. I did use it uh, briefly for the final stages of the rocket, however asparagus is going to be much more prominent in this mission. I'm also attaching plenty of science gear to my rocket, 8 goo canisters, because I'll be visiting two celestial bodies. I've also got the new solar panels which will attract, as well as some batteries as I said, to prevent what happened in the last episode. There are plenty of parachutes on the rocket as well, because landing on Duna is easier with the f because it has an atmosphere, but its atmosphere is still very thin. So I wanted to guarantee that I'd land there as safely as possible, so I've, in I've incorporated m lots of parachutes to my design. I'm also going to be using some new NASA parts, as you can see, in the form of the solid rocket boosters which will help give the whole rocket a little kick up into orbit and that'll help with the whole mission because since I've incorporated Ike into the whole video this video, oh sorry, this mission requires a lot more Delta V than I'd originally planned I also set up an asparagus system with the lower stage a much bigger one, here I am, I'm doing it at the moment and this'll uh, make sure to get me into orbit a little bit more efficiently than normal. I'm calling the rocket Eres, which is the Greek version of Mars, the god of war, which is quite fitting as some parts of this mission can be rather turbulent. However, um, let's not focus on that at the moment, and as we all know, Duna is based on Mars, so I figured it was a fitting name. There are plenty of contracts featuring in this episode, as I've already showed you, which will also help to give this whole mission a nice healthy science boost. Now at the moment what you're looking at is the map view, and here in red you can see Duna's orbit. To get there, as you saw briefly, I tried to align Kerbin with a 45 degree angle so that Duna is just above. That will mean we encounter it efficiently, and also uh, requires less fuel, which is actually the same thing, I don't know why I repeated myself. <laughs> now you can also see in the design that embedded in there are four radial engines. Those will help give the rock a little extra kick, because I didn't use a mainsail. I would rather spend more on extra rocket parts and science gear than a bigger engine. Two stages dropped off very quickly there, the solid rocket boosters as well as the first asparagus stage and now you can see the four engines I was talking about a little more clearly. They are not very efficient, but do have quite a lot of thrust, which is very key. And also, in, uh, in atmosphere, efficiency is too much of a problem because it's low anyway. Now you can see I'm trying to get into orbit, and from orbit I'm going to get a straight Duna encounter. Look at that! Very nicely done. and almost as efficient as you can get. I've encountered Duna pretty much where my solar apoapsis was, which, as I said, is very efficient. I've got a lot of thrust on that rocket, although the stage has just come. 
So um, this stage will burn through its fuel quickly, but should get us well into Kerbin orbit. From there, the Poodle engine will take over, which is another size 2 part, but has much less thrust, but a very good 390 specific impulse. That'll be plenty in order to get from Kerbin orbit to Duna, and then we're, then we're away. In the meantime, you can see that the burn, once I decoupled that last stage, increased a lot more than I thought it, it ended up being about two and a half minutes. And from my composition, two and a half minutes burning around would decrease the accuracy of my encounter with Duna by a lot. So, what I did, I waited until I orbited Kerbin a second time so that I can burn up my periapsis again so that I don't alter my Duna encounter too much. As you're about to see, I get a nice encounter without having too much of a change from my estimated target. There we go, there we go. it's appeared, and now we can just focus on getting out into space. Anyway, so by burning at the periapsis, what you saw just then, I made use of what's known as the Oberth effect. You may have heard of this, but you probably haven't. I learned about this very recently, and is actually not too complicated, but it's a very good technique for maximizing efficiency in a rocket. I'll go on to that in just a moment, but in the meantime, we can focus on the fact that Jebediah Kerman is the first Kerbal to get into deep space. Because of this, we can take some new science data, which actually provides a lot of information. 55 science and 88 science, respectively, helps to give this mission a nice little boost for science points, making this mission, when um, taken into, well, yeah, when the contracts are taken into account, the whole mission will be very profitable. Anyway, the Oberth effect basically means burning at the periapsis is more efficient. And that's because when you go at your periapsis, your rocket is travelling its fastest, therefore the fuel inside your rocket is well, has the most kinetic energy, and so by burning fuel with more energy, you get more thrust from it without having to do too much else. That means that your rocket is more efficient by burning at the periapsis, so I spent less fuel than I would have normally. It also means that I didn't upset my Duna encounter too much, which I would have done if I didn't do that. Now, although it requires a lot of tinkering, I ultimately get my Duna periapsis down once I do a course correction in space which means that I encounter Duna much lower, and much more much closer than I would have normally. By doing these corrections early on in my orbit, almost as soon as I left Kerbin's sphere of influence, I again maximise the efficiency, rather than doing them once I get to Duna, because that will require more delta V. The changes I make at this point are magnified much more uh, later on in the mission. Increasing the delta V I have in this mission is crucial since I hadn't originally a plan to go to Ike as well. However, I feel it should be doable and now we can just begin to start the burn to get my periapsis down to less than a million meters which is what, what I'd sort of call acceptable. The burn is very brief, 0.4 meters per second of delta V needed and there we go. I kept the uh, throttle up a little longer than I should have, but 910,000 meters, that's not too bad. We can easily tweak that once we get to Duna, and we actually have slightly more fuel than I was expecting, especially with an efficient engine. This shouldn't be too hard at all. Now, once we get to Duna, we can also take some even, even more science which will help stack up nicely. We can also begin using the goo samples which I had not used in orbit around the sun. Once we get to Duna, we are going to perform an aerobraking maneuver, which I'm setting up at the moment. I want to get there so that I'm pretty much in line with the equator of the planet, because then it'll mean getting to Ike is much easier. Aerobraking is a very efficient form of slowing down, and only can only be done with planets with atmospheres, and although Duna's atmosphere is very thin, it's got a very tenuous atmosphere, 
um, it'll still help a lot by using the atmospheric drag on our rocket to slow down rather than burning fuel. Anyway, by encountering the equator, Ike orbits at roughly that al at that position, so then we can get there nicely. Also, it's worth noting that I aim to go to Ike before Duna, since that will, in my mind, increase efficiency. Just before I go on to that, I can also say that we've completed the first objective in uh, getting some Duna science. We took some science not only near Duna, but also in the atmosphere, which will stack up nicely. Now, I actually underestimated how much Duna will slow my rocket down, so I end up with a much closer orbit than I'd have liked, which requires a plane, well not a plane change, a sort of, a, well just a change later on in order to uh, increase my apoapsis. This wasn't um, what I wanted, but it had to be done because, as I would say, the I, I want to encounter Ike before Duna because that, in my mind, increases efficiency. I think it works like this. I might be wrong, but basically, I think that encountering Ike with less mass, well, sorry, with, with more mass instead of Duna would be more efficient. If I burn through most of my fuel at Ike and then to a couple lower stages, I can then uh, do that in Ike's lower gravity rather than Duna's much higher gravity. So landing, if I landed the rocket in its full form in this state on Luna now, then went to Ike, it, I've, I don't know, I think it'd be less efficient because the mass of the rocket would be higher. Doing it this order means that I land on Duna and have to escape Duna with a much lighter um, spaceship. So in, yeah, I think that makes it more efficient. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Now I'm waiting until Ike's orbit got a little further around Duna because similar to my Mimus mission, I'm aiming to land right um, so that it's, I'm facing away from Ike's motion around Duna. That'll mean that to get to Duna, all I have to do is burn straight up, which um, requires a minimum effort. But I wanted to do it so that the point uh, facing away from Duna's, oh, sorry, Ike's motion is in daylight. Now I've also began to complete some science around Ike, which, yeah, we're halfway through the contract already. Things are going pretty well, and as I say, I've got plenty of fuel in this rocket. I think I'm able to land there without even separating the stage. Ike has quite a lot less gravity than usual, so things should go relatively simple. However, I'm going to hand you over to my old self, so that I can talk you through a live landing. Here we go, we're landing on the Ike for the first time. Things are going pretty well, and we should... Since I made the base of the rocket very wide, not to topple over, well, even though the centre of gravity of the ship is very high up. Look at Duna there, hanging over the horizon. Looks like it's just balanced on the edge of, the, of Ike, although not anymore. We're now uh, just slowing down. This should be pretty good. Ooh, maybe the slope's a little more than normal. No! Oh no, no! No, come on! The fuel's empty as well! This is, no, no! Oh no, I'm gonna have to retry. Oh no, please, please, please go well. Oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna have to rescue Jebediah. Okay, we're gonna have to try landing again. <laughs> it's already given us the tick for landing on Ike, which is even more annoying. <laughs> Right, let's try slowing down and stopping about here. Let's land just here. Come on, this should go pretty well. Come on. This looks flatter. I've even had a talk to my spaceship. Come on, this should be fine. There we go! We landed on Ike! And there we go! We have landed on Ike. And now we can start collecting some science. We can also appreciate the fact that Jebediah is now not only the first Kerbal to reach into, well, a solar orbit, but also the first Kerbal to land on another body other than one in the Kerbin, Kerbin system. We can now also 
plant a flag on Ike, which is another first step in conquering Duna system, which will ultimately progress to the series' grand goal of landing a Kerbal on every planet and moon in the game. We can also take some surface samples and data, which is very uh, profitable, more than I thought, but now focus on planting the flag. The flag there is nicely illuminated by the sun, and sadly, I've got to admit, I have to speed up this footage, because when I planted this, I couldn't think about what to write. I'm a pretty quick typer, but I just couldn't remember, I couldn't think about what to type. So, instead I settled with the fact that, although the landing nearly went badly, thanks to Jib's piloting skills, the landing went well, and we are safe. We can now focus on getting back, well not getting back, but landing on Duna, which will be the main um, input of science data in this mission, as well as uh, being another step to our goal of planting a flag on it. We've now completed the Ike contracts, and we can now focus on completing Duna's contract too. Since the external fuel tanks with the landing legs on now are completely empty, I can decouple those straight after launch. We should be decoupling them any moment now, so that they explode on the surface so I don't want to leave rubble, but it doesn't look like they have, so they'll, they'll be there for years to come, millennia, sitting on Ike's surface. Now, what I was talking about earlier is the fact that we all have to do now is burn pretty much straight up to get a nice Duna encounter, which was initially poking tantalizingly close just above Ike's horizon. By burning straight up, I cancel out some of the velocity I've gained by, by being on Ike, which is orbiting the planet. If I cancel out that velocity, I'll drop down to Duna with a, a low periapsis, or I may not have one at all. I should be just about to break out of Ike's field of influence, and there we go. My periapsis is decreasing. There we go. I've got a nice Duna collision. Initially, I don't want it to be a, con a direct encounter because um, Duna's atmosphere is very thin. So I want to ensure that the parachutes have enough time to act by having a very gradual and shallow encounter, which I'll set up in a moment. Also, you'll, you can see what I mean by having a lighter rocket. Since Duna has much more gravity, having a lighter rocket means escaping the planet will be much easier than with a heavier rocket. So, since this stage is about to be depleted, I can then decouple it, and then I can focus on the final stage, which is all asparagus. Burning again at the periapsis is also efficient, and also, since the periapsis is on the dark side of the planet, I can choose my landing spot to be in the sunlight, which makes the landing much easier. Unlike Ike, Duna isn't quite so mountainous from my experiences, so wherever I land should be relatively flat. We can also get science data from the atmosphere as well as space on the planet, which will add up to even more science than the Ike gave us. Here we go, a very gradual descent with a low periapsis should be enough to slowly bring our ship down to a nice manageable speed to land safely. <sighs> yes, it's going pretty well, however, We'll have to see what happens in the next episode. I'm going to have to cut it roughly here because this episode has gone on for slightly longer than most others. So, although we can see Duna just below us, and although the sun is about to break over the horizon, we'll have to wait until the next episode. So, it's all up to me to say goodbye. See you in the next episode.